I or, or my company is using Node is because it's freaking fast. It's really, really, really fast. Uh, if you compare this to, to other script-based languages that are not compiled, it's I, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure it's one of the fastest script languages you can get there. It is actually faster than .NET and uh, some other compiled languages, like Java. Um, if you're going to be close to the same speed as Node.js, you really need to know what you're doing when you're writing your code and compiling your code. So it's super, super fast. Um, and it's also a very mainstream language. It's, it's using JavaScript, so there is a lot of people knowing it. And there is a lot of, of packages and code out there when you're writing your applications. So um, pretty early in Node's um, life, the uh, Node packet, package management uh, system was uh, created, um, the NPM. And you can find it on this URL. And currently, there is almost a quarter of a million packets published. Uh, I would say that like 230,000 of them are crap, but there is a few that is really, really good as well. And they, it's a really good source to, to find uh, tools. Uh, quite often when, when we are trying to solve difficult things uh, and we need to use some kind of technology, you, we always go out to, to, uh, to, to the site and see if there is any available libraries that we can use that helps us. And so far, we usually find stuff that helps us. Uh, there are, are things for, for almost everything. So I'm going to start from a really, really simple level here. And I'm going to write a really small um, node uh, application. Um, and you guys need to shout when I do something wrong, because I will. And you all said that you're awesome JavaScript developers. So I'm going to do into this folder. Let's do this. Oh, that's big. Does that work or should it be bigger? Oh. Cool. So um, let's do hello world, but let's do it with a twist. So uh, let's start with uh, a simple for loop. Um, something like, while well, it's less than 10. And hello world. I'm totally off here. Um, let's put it here. Uh, let's call it hello. Are, are we good with what this is doing? Should we explain it? Yeah, let's explain it. So this is a for loop. So it's something that will go on. We start off by declaring a variable and, and uh, define it as zero. And then we will loop until i is, or as long as i is less than 10. And we in increase with one each time. And every time we are, are doing the console log. So if, if everything is fine, uh, so I'm writing node hello. So that is actually invoking the node application locally on my machine and running the file. And hooray, it worked. And very, very simple application. Um, but again, it was JavaScript. And I was running it on my machine without a browser. And I think that's pretty cool. This would probably not benchmark very well, because it's one thing uh, I'm doing. But if I were running like a, a web application that I will be doing shortly, this would be perform very well. Um, yes, so that's quickly about Node. Um, when you're writing web application, which is, I would say, one of the most common use cases, you need to be able to handle web requests. So when uh, a browser 
accesses your application. You need to be able to handle that. Quite often when you're writing application in other languages like PHP, uh, .NET or something else, you are relying on a web server. So you have Apache or IIS or one of these servers that is actually doing this for you. But when you're ru running um, node applications, you don't have a web server. So actually you need to handle the whole web handling request yourself in your application. That can be a pretty daunting task to actually implement a web server every time you're writing a web application. And you don't want to do that. So what you do is you use something like Express. Uh, Express is more or less the de facto standard for Node.js when you're writing web application. Uh, quite often you hear about the mean stack, for example, uh, or the pin stack, which is uh, a, a short for, for kind of the parts you're using in your application. So a pin stack would be Postgres, Express, Angular, and Node. For example, that's the technologies you're using. So um, Express is always, more or less always there. Um, it's very inspired by Sinatra, which is another framework uh, used by Ruby developers, I believe. Um, very famous. It's very easy to install uh, into your application um, by a simple NPM call. NPM is the node package manager that I mentioned before. And it's also a binary that you install on your server or on your machine if you want to. So let's extend or, or build the application with, with, with Express so that we can receive our request from, from the outside. So I'm going to go back into, um, into here. I'm just going to take a quick look here and remove some stuff from, from this. And package. Pack. Let's do that. So, and be before we write the Express stuff, we will need the Express module, which is the library. And of course, you can go out to the net, find that, and download it and install it by yourself. But instead of doing that, we'll be using the NPM, the Node Package Manager. And it's pretty simple. This is uh, a new project, so we can initialize that by writing NPM in it. And I need to write some stuff here. Uh, so let's say foo talk, uh, my name. No, ah, sorry, foo talk version one, um, a test application uh, server. So this is the, uh, the file that we should start um, when we run this uh, application. And we don't have anything of this. Yes. So what happened now was really that a, a file file called package.js or JSON was created down there. Um, a very small JSON file. Um, and as I said, we want to use Express in this application. So let's install that and we'll do that with uh, NPM as well. And I'm going to use save. So now I'm actually going out to, to, to the internets and downloading the library. And I can look at this file again and you'll see now it's ad actually added the dependency to the library here. And that means that when I source control this application later on, I will actually not put the express library into source control. I will only keep the package.json file in, in source control and be fetching what I need from this. Uh, I think Composer and these other uh, package systems do more or less the same thing. Uh, th this node module folder here was created when I used uh, install, and that is where we'll find the express libraries if we want to look at the code. So um, let's um, write some JavaScript code. So we're going to write a new new file here. And the first thing we need to do is, of course, um, find an instance of um, of Express. We'll do that like that. So, uh, at any time, feel free just to shout and ask questions and, and stop me if if there is any questions. By the way, 
So I'm going to save this as server.js already now so we can get some syntax highlighting. And so now I have a reference to, to the library here. And uh, with this library, I want to create my app that we're going to run. So let's do that with express, uh, like, like this. And now our application needs to do something. Um, so let's, let's write the, the implementation of our web service here. It can be using like a template system or whatever, but this is a very simple, uh, simple thing just to kind of demo express for you guys. Um, so I'm going to create a function. And it's in this function, I uh, get the um, request and the response. So the request is essentially what I get from Express from the from the framework when someone is accessing my site. So I can see like the the URLs, get any parameters sent over to me, and uh, cookies and those kind of things. And here in there, we will simply use the result. So this is what's gonna be sent back to to the web browser. I'm simply gonna say that the status should be 200, which is uh, HTTP status code 200, which means okay. If you're using REST applications, uh, you usually use the status code to signal if uh, your command was successful or, or not. So for example, if you have a REST API and you can implement that using Node and Express, that's very common or you write something that is picked up from an Angular application, you also quite often use the status code to, to, to parse the result. Uh, but we can also send back a message here. So this is the another Hello World application. Um, now we need to you know, connect our implementation, the code, to the request. And We'll do that with the app we created in the bo uh, up, up there with uh, Express. And we'll say when, when we get a GET request, which is a normal request in the browser, that gum goes to test like this, uh, we should be running uh, our function here. And here I'm saying start listening to port 5004 requests. So this is a really short web application written uh, with a node and um, express. So let's see if this starts. Nothing happened. Is that a good or a bad sign? It's a really good sign. <laughs> So um, it means actually that my application is running. And as I said before, um, Node is, is smart enough to understand when there is things left in the event queue or the, if there is callbacks. So now we are actually, uh, Express is, is sitting here and waiting for, um, for us to come back. So I'm going to bring up a new screen here and uh, I'm going to go to localhost and say test. This is, I know this is really small, but it said, it said hello world. And it's, it's really simple to, to change this to something else. So like this, and uh, then I, if I go in here now and oops, I run again, nothing happens. Why is that I changed the code? I didn't uh, restart node and node takes the code and put that into memory. So now we need to stop Node and start again. And that is one of the features or, or reasons why Node is so fa fast. It keeps uh, the, the, the code in memory. So if I take this up again, the, uh, the output changes. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Express? Cool. Um, this is really the, the crucial crucial line. Here we, we map the request to the function. Uh, this can be done a lot more advanced. Uh, you can add on parameters here, for example. You can say that after test, we'll do that later on, I want a param parameter saying 
it could be an ID or something that we're pulling in to be able to generate some code from a database, for example. But we can also add other functions in before here that could, for example, check that you have been authenticated, that you have a valid session. Uh, and there is also other frameworks or, or libraries on NPM uh, that is kind of plugins to express. Uh, and a few of the, the common ones is a body parser, which looks at, at the body of the request. So when you do a post request, you can get, for example, a JSON structure in the body. And then that library is helping us working with that. There is a, a cookie parser that is looking at the, uh, the header values coming in and parsing them as a cookie so they are easily uh, available in, in, in these structures. We'll later on talk about uh, Twilio. Twilio also have a library on Node.js or on, on uh, NPM, which one of these preprocessor functions, which is really good. It helps when you're write, writing things for, for Twilio. Uh, but it's, it's still all based on Express. So next step to be able to build our application, we, uh, we need a, a place to store data. And there is a lot of different places you can do that, of course. Um, you could write it directly to file if you want to. Um, or you can use uh, you know, a, a cache, a memcache, or a, a lot of different kind of databases. The reason we are not writing this to, to file is because we're going to host um, our application on Heroku. And yeah, you can, write, you can create files on Heroku, but if you're a dyno, I'll talk more about what a dyno is, it's kind of an instance or a Docker container, or it's a, a shell where you're running your, uh, your application. If that cycles or restarts, all files you have created locally will disappear. So um, usually it's easier to log stuff into a database than to, to you know, mount an S3 image or something to, to write things there. So uh, SQL is, I think, is a pretty good um, way of doing this, especially if you're writing applications for Heroku, because Postgres is you know, the standard database, I would say, if you're writing um, or building Heroku applications. There are a lot of other databases as well you can use, but Postgres is one of the, the more common ones. It's an open source database, so you can easily install it locally on your machine that you're doing your development on. Uh, there is a lot of tool, a lot, uh, tools, a lot of documentations, and if you run into problems, uh, the answer is just Google away. So it's, uh, I think it's a good database, and it performs pretty well. Uh, it can do transactions. Um, way back uh, when MySQL couldn't do transactions, that was the uh, you know the the reason to choose MySQL or Postgres when you're writing your applications. Did we, were you in the need of transactions or were you in the need of of stored procedures or functions? That was and is still all available in in Postgres. Postgres also have the um, ability to use JSON structured data. So essentially, you can create a column in your table where you put in JSON data and you define it as JSON data. And so, so you can actually put unstructured data into a structured database, which is pretty cool, and do um, queries against that unstructured data. Um, useful. And of course, there is uh, a node a module for, for it called PG that we will be using. How many of you have been working with SQL databases before? Everyone, okay, cool. So uh, let's do this quick then. Um, I don't have uh, any um, SQL database running locally, um, but I'm gonna connect to a database in anyway, uh, just so you know what I'm doing. Um, on, on Heroku, you can install um, a database as an add-on to your application, so I'm gonna use an, an application and connect to that database uh, to, to demo this. So um, just gonna connect quickly to that database. 
So this is nothing strange. It's, it's a database in, in the cloud on Heroku that has a few tables already. We will not use those tables. We'll create a new table, a very simple table. Um, something like, we call it test table. And we'll just throw in a few columns here. Big serial. And we say that's a primary key. And let's put in something else here too. Or char uh, 200. Something like that. And we need to have some data in here as well. Insert into table test, uh, table, and name. That's the column we're going to put data into. Anybody else that wants to? Uh, okay. Anyone else? Linus. I just need some values in here. Cool. So there should be. Um, you're all famous now, guys because this will be on the internet. So a simple table with just a few values. Nothing weird or strange at all. Um, now I need to quit. And uh, I'm going to go in here again. Snippets. And I'm going to actually show you something. Um, I'm not going to write this code, but this is kind of the, I think, most copied code in the Node universe. This is how you query the database. This is the uh, little uh, snippet. Uh, so essentially what this is, it's a mo module within Node. Uh, it's defined here, uh, a method called query. And we put this query, this function, in into that value. So when we're using this file later on, we'll, this is actually what exposes this code. Um, it's a very simple uh, function. Um, there is a query, that is the SQL query that we're putting into, into this parameter here. And then it's uh, all the values. So we're not building a, a complete SQL query, we're actually putting a, a query with parameters with in inside. And the reason we are doing that is because we want to be protected from SQL injection. So you should never build your SQL dynamically. And then a callback. And again, we're using the callback because node is asynchronous and a call to the database will be slow. It will probably take two milliseconds, but that's slow, so we are not waiting for it. Uh, we start off by doing a connection to the da database, and this is something you'll see pretty often when we're writing node, Node.js stuff. And that is that we are putting out, um, I can actually do it here, this piece up here. Um, it's a, param a parameter or a configuration variable. If you're writing .NET, you would have the web.config file. We would put this information into. Uh, if you were writing PHP, you would probably have a config.php or something in your application where you would be pulling out this information from. When you're writing Node.js applications, uh, especially pizza, OK, two minutes and you'll get pizza. When you're writing Node.js applications, you don't write config files, especially not if you're hosting them on Heroku. Um, or other services like this, you're actually relying on the environment. So you're throwing those, those things up into to the environment. Um, and as you can see, this is al also a asynchronous function because we are defining a callback here. So the connection can take some time. That can take a few milliseconds, and we're not waiting for that either. We're starting that, um, that process, and then we're returning. And when that's done, we will go into this, um, this callback here. And if it failed, we say it failed and, and go back out. And if it was OK, we will do the query. And as I said, this is heavily copied on, on the internet. So um, it's easy to find, but you'll get all the code anyway. So um, I showed you the db.js file before, and that's a module. And the first change I needed to do to this code was actually to include that module into my, my project. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm creating a new object here called DB. And then I changed the, the, my function a little bit as well. It's a little bit more code in here now. So the first thing I'm doing is that I'm pulling out a parameter from the request. So the request is coming from Express into my function. 
and I'm looking at the parameters and t pulling out the username. And this means essentially if this is empty, I'm going to use test user as default because I don't want to have a null value. And then I'm just doing some logging. And here I'm actually right using the, the database module that we wrote before. So as I said, the first parameter is this SQL query, or sorry, SQL query. SQL queries is in Salesforce. Um, I'm fetching the ID and the name, and I'm putting in a parameter like this. So I'm not putting my, I, I don't use what I got from the request in my query here. I'm putting that in here. So we, that's protecting us against injection attacks which is really important. And then I have my callback. So essentially, the code in here is what I will reach to when I've connected to the database and queried the database. So I s simply check if something went wrong or if I didn't find anything. Then I'm, sa I'm sending a 400 error and saying something went wrong. Otherwise, I'm sending 200 and telling you what your ID is. Um, and the final change is actually the mapping here against request or against the express. Before we just have test, now I'm telling express that I'm expecting there to be a parameter here called username. And if you have been writing Angular things, this is very similar to what you're used to. So, um, oops. The first thing we need to do is. Um, to make sure we get access to the database uh, lab libraries, the pd.js. Um, so let's do that with uh, npm install, and that was called pg, and I'll say save. Hopefully this works. Hopefully I still have internet. Look at that. I mean, if you take a quick look at my package, you can see that now it's added down here in the bottom. It says, I now rely on this library as well. So, um, where is my mouse pointer? There. And before, I also said before we stop that in Node, we usually use the environment to configure things. So here you can see, um, I'm going to push something to the environment of my shell. And this is a connection screen, a string to the database. And yes, that's my password and stuff in there. So um, you should be careful with that. So let's um, see if this runs. Or I spelled something wrong. Looks good. So let's go into our browser. And I'm going to go to the same tab here. And I'm now just going to refresh this. And now it says it cannot get this uh, URL. And that's because I changed Express. Express is now expecting me to enter a username. So I need to add that in here as well. So I'm going to add my username. Ooh, I got an IDX back. So if we go back to the code, I put Mark because Mark volunteered. So I put that, pull that out here and put that into MySQL, got the IDX, and printed that to, to the browser. So here we connected to, to a database from Node and pulled out the information. And this database was actually hosted on Heroku, so I didn't have it locally. Any questions so far? Uh, yeah. It's Sublime. It's my editor. Okay, cool. So it's just um, uh, a short. And if you guys see me writing uh, H-E-R sometimes, which is kind of in my spine, it's just an alias for Heroku. And Heroku is, Heroku is the tool belt, so I'll, I'll get to that shortly. If you can save three characters every time you write that, it's, it's good in the end of the day. So that was the database, and now it's the final component. This is Twilio, and Twilio is the, uh, the tool that is um, receiving the SMSs from, from our providers and converting them to web traffic. And um, the guys at Twilio is very nice to us. They gave me this promo code, 
Uh, it's $20 off for an upgrade. I don't know more than that. I don't know how for long it lasts or anything. I just got it, so uh, feel free to try it out. I haven't tried it, so. Um, they are, this is a company that is really, really, really developer friendly. Uh, if you're gonna write a developer app and you have any question whatsoever, they are great. They have people hired just to go out and evangelize their, their tool against developers. So they, they're really good to, to, uh, to work with. Uh, we work with SMS or text messages in, in this application, but you can actually use voice messages too. So you can write an application you can get a number, you can call in with your phone, and you can actually have your Node.js application take that call and talk to the p person calling by using uh, API functions in Twilio. It's super cool. Um, and it can also do VoIP stuff, a lot of different things. Um, but for, for this application, we, um, we need a number, right, to send the messages to. And what you can do then is simply go into Twilio. Yes, Twilio. Let's um, try to go in here. Um, so you can create an account at Twilio, a test account for free. Um, you can get a, a voice number for free. You can send and receive text messages, messages from pre-registered phone numbers for free. So you can play around with this a lot for free. Also, you can do inbound and outbound calls and have a lot of fun for free with uh, Twilio. So uh, it, it's it's fun to to uh, to work with. But let's uh, buy a new number. Um, yeah, we should have text messages capabilities. Uh, let's buy this one. That looks nice, don't you think, Andreas? Yeah. Buy this number. You can have one number for free, and then you need to pay one dollar a month for them. Setup number, uh, we need to do that shortly. Um, here are some codes and stuff that we will need to, to um, do. But let's get back to that shortly. I'm not sure I um, have the guts to start Keynote again. Um, let's let's look at the um, the complete application. So I'm not going to write that from scratch. I'm going to do git clone uh, foo to foo sms two. Uh, sorry, wrong one. So I just clone the repository um, and. Sublime again to open it. So this is the whole whole everything of this application that we demoed before. It's not big at all. Let's start and look at the, the package JSON, JSON file. So uh, dependencies up here, you can see there is a couple of more in here. Um, we have the body parser and cookie parser are these applications for Express that I, I talked before. Uh, we also have Express, uh, which is a module. ICE is, is a little library that is fantastic if you're writing you Node.js know, applications. Uh, imagine you um, have a outbound call from your application that gets a JSON structure back that is behaving weird. And if you're printing that to the console, it looks crappy. You can't read it. It's so hard to debug. Then you use eyes to pretty print that into the console so you can actually read what's in that uh, JSON file, for example. And it can handle a lot of different uh, data types. It's super good. It would be the, the shell yeah. or the console where your application is running. I'll show you that later on too, when we're setting up the Heroku app. It's uh, got another question here before about logging as well. Uh, but it's to deal with, with, with logging. New Relic, um, monitoring software. Uh, you can use it to, uh, to see how well your app is performing. We'll not use it for, for this application. PG, we just talked about. 
um, the database, and then the, the Twilio library and validator. Um, so let's uh, let's start from the top, from from the server file. This is incredibly big, isn't it? So um, the top up here, we're just initializing a lot of modules that we have installed with, with Node. So we have, for example, the database um, that is uh, similar to what we did. I'll show you that shortly. But uh, replies is a file with some configurations, we can say. We have some stop and start words. Um, and this is if, if you're going to write an SMS application, you need to comply to some EU regulations. So if you have a, number, a list of numbers uh, that you are spamming using text messages, you should respect these words to cancel your subscription. It's good to know if you get spammed by someone. You should just reply with stop. And if they are not stopping to spam you, you contact your, uh, your uh, provider and they will block the, that delivery into the network. Um, then we have a config variable here. And this is the authentication token against Twilio. So to be able to talk to the Twilio APIs, we will need an authentication token. And we'll get that from the web page. It's nothing strange. We just need to push that into the environment. Database URL, that is what, you know, what we showed before. Then we go into um, to the setup of, of the uh, the application here. And we are creating the express. We are configuring body parser. And body parser will help us handle the call from Twilio. So the call from Twilio will uh, contain a formatted text called Twil ML, um, which is it's all in their manuals. But we won't read it. We don't care about that, essentially, because we will have a library helping us working with that. And we also have the cookie parser. And the, this is a really cool thing with, with Twilio. It actually, you can set a session. So essentially, when, when you get an SMS, you will get a call from Twilio to your application. And th that is not different from any other call you would get from a browser. So what you can say is to Twilio, set cookie. And then you can set a session. And then when you get a, the next response from the phone, you will actually get that session back so you know who, who sent the message to you. Um, and we're actually using that, and, and we're using the cookie parser to, to help us with that. And then the actual meat of the application happens. Um, we are defining one endpoint, and that is the SMS one. So Twilio will post into us, and it's not a get anymore. And then here, you see um, Twilio.webhook. And this is from the Twilio library. And this is in, into the Express one as well. So this is an extension to, to Express that will help us do a lot, lot of things, actually. It will help us parse the Twil, um, uh, that this, uh, this code from, from Twilio so that we can easily um, deal with it. We will actually get an object out of this that we can work with. But it will also authenticate Twilio for us, which means uh, I can't write another application talking to my JavaScript Node.js application pretending to be Twilio. This, uh, this library will help us using the API keys to, to verify that it's actually Twilio that is calling us, which can be good for security reasons. And then th there is, uh, as you know before, we used my function before. Now this is an, anon an anonymous function here instead. But it works the same way. And of course, we do some debug logging here. And here I talked about the session ID. When this starts out, I set that to, to null or empty. And then I'm, I'm pulling out uh, the foo SMS cookie, if it exists, and, and populate the session ID. And then we are looking a little bit up on the, on the body here. So if the, um, if the body is empty 
or I don't get a from number. So if I get this from an anonymous number, I won't deal with this request. So I'll abort it, essentially. That's, that's what's going on here. And then I'm putting pulling out the, the from number, who sent me the message. Uh, because all of you guys that did the demo, I have all your phone numbers and emails and names and stuff in the database now. Um, so I will spam you all night. Um, but th that is what I'm doing here. I'm pulling out the, the number. Um, and then you you remember that you you said foo SMS or foo cafe. I think foo cafe, first name last name. Uh, here I'm actually looking at um, at the text and I'm splitting it based on on new lines or on 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 a space character or white character. And if if I get um, more than two parameters, it's the first SMS I got because it's the it's foo cafe, it's first name last name, and sometimes it could be foo cafe first name, middle name, last name, or whatever. We deal with that here. And with this information that we received, we will be calling the database medal, uh, a method or module with, uh, with the create subscription method. I'll show you that shortly. And, but essentially, it takes the data we just gathered and pushes that into the database. And when that is all done, we set, set a cookie so we know who you are when you reply with your email ad address. And then we send a reply to, uh, to Twilio. And when we're sending the reply to Twilio, that reply would actually become a, a text message going back to the phone. So we are able here to have a conversation back and forth with the phone using the, the session. And the, the second method here, or second part, is essentially looking for stop words or start words. So people can stop or, or start their uh, subscription but also enter their email address. So if, if I only get one word sent in to me, I'm expecting that to be the email. There is probably a lot of holes in the logic here, but it just shows you what you can do. Um, and then we're using different methods here in the database to, to do that, so it's helper methods. So I, in, in my server file, I don't write the SQL for everything. I've all my SQL logic is in one file. And app response. Yeah. Um, this is just a method I'm using in here to create the response back to Twilio. Nothing strange, really. So let's just quickly take a look at this database file now. This is the same thing as we talked about before, but now here is a, f more, a few more additional helper methods to, to stick data into the database and how that can be done. Um, questions so far? Yes? Um, yeah, so this this is um, a, m a method or a function. It's a function variable. So let's let's take a look at at uh, which one can be easy uh, to look at. Let's look at the create subscription. They all have a callback, and the reason they all have a callback is because they are asynchronous. They will take some time to do. So in if I um, open my server file here. So this is the first file we just looked at. We have the create subscription. So what has happened so far is I got the text message from Twilio. I've looked at it. I know what, what kind of message it is. And to this method, I'm passing in the data. And the last, I, I always put the callback as the last parameter in, in my functions because it's easy to find. So this is the last one. It's here. And as you can see, this it's a function, it's defined function. But it could as well be a parameter because that's how, how JavaScript is handling functions. Um, so I'm defining the function here and passing that into my method as uh, an, an object. 
So the object that my, my method receives is actually a function that it can call. Um, and that would look like this. So essentially what happens is uh, my Node.js application get the call. It will fall into this, uh, this function here and query is an asynchronous call. So that would actually return directly. Um, which means that my function create subscription will return directly way before we have connected to the database, way before we've got any results from the database. It will just uh, return. So the whole application will return the whole way out to uh, essentially the end. But since node knows and remembers that I'm waiting for a callback, it will not terminate. It will wait for, for in this case, the, uh, the Postgres functions to say, okay, I'm done with your requests. And then I will actually be injected. The execution pointer will go in into this callback here. So I will actually end up here. And then you see I'm, I'm there is a callback. I'm calling the callback callback. Yeah, to be obvious. <laughs> uh, so it's actually using that, that method up here to continue the execution. So it's, um, when you start out doing this, it's a mess. And if you're not careful, you will uh, fall into this asynchronous tree trap. It just explodes with asynchronous calls. And that is, when you start structuring your application, that is a real challenge. And it's ind independent of what language you're using. It's a challenge to structure your applications. Node is good because you can use these modules to structure it and, and um, contain functionality. So you can kind of hide this as asynchronous behavior. But this is what makes Node fast. Can I use promises? You can use promises as well, yeah. True. But that, those are so hard to understand. Any other questions? Yes, 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 it is. So that was the application we've demoed, uh, and it's way too much to to build. But it's it's a pretty application that is pretty quickly to to build. It took me to two and a half hour to, to stitch together. Um, and now the goal is to get this onto to the cloud, to Heroku, to host it somewhere. And before we do that, I was just shortly mentioning Heroku a little bit, what it is. And this is actually a, a, a pass or a platform as a service. So this is where we're going to host our application. Um, and Always when I talk about this, I always get a question. Why should I use this that costs like 35 or 25 bucks a month, whatever it is for one dyno, when I can get an Amazon instance for nothing? Um, it's different things. Heroku actually runs on Amazon. Uh, it's using Amazon infrastructure. But the difference here is I, am, I as a developer don't need to care about making sure my, my Linux is up to date, or it's patched, or setting up the infrastructure to make sure I can load balance my application. I don't need to care about installing my Postgres database. I just tell Heroku what I need, deploy my application, and off I go. And I never need to care about the, the, the infrastructure of the platform. That's the idea, at least. Then, of course, some sometimes there are issues. Um, Heroku was built for uh, hosting Ruby, or Ruby on Rails, back in 2007. Uh, but now you can run a lot of different things here. Um, Java, Node, Go, if you like writing in Go. It's co cool. PHP, Python, um, a lot of things. And you can actually, if you want to, and if you want to be fancy, you can actually build your own build pack or your own environment. But when you're doing that, I think you're in a way 
loses out of the whole value because then you need to maintain the build pack. And the build pack actually gives you the, the ability to customize your environment. And that can be using, um, uh, you can install, so you actually can run uh, .NET applications on Heroku as well, for example. It can also be that you are, you need some application that's not available as an add-on at Heroku. Then you can use a custom build pack to get that onto to your application. But then, of course, you need to maintain that going forward. Uh, and the reason I use uh, Heroku or know so much about Heroku is because Salesforce, which I've been using for the last or working with for the last seven or eight years, bought Heroku back in 2010. Back in 2010, you, we, I didn't use Heroku. I started to use it like two years ago. Heroku is using what's called dynos, and a dyno can be of different sizes. It's essentially a compute unit or a container. It's not Docker. Um, you can get the Heroku environment as a Docker container, but they're not using the Docker containers for distributing the, the code. Um, but it's kind of like a shell where your application lives in. They, f they come in a bit different sizes, uh, and that's mostly in regards to um, available memory and CPU power. And the really cool thing, I think, is that you deploy and do everything using Git and the Heroku tool belt, which means you can build really awesome um, continuous integration solutions super, super easy, uh, because it's just standard tools. Uh, the Heroku tool belt is just something you download and install in your, your application. That's the Heroku or, or command I've been using. If, if you go into Heroku, uh, okay. it's uh, easy to create a new application. And again, you can create applications in here for free. That doesn't cost you anything. And if you're having a hobby project, you can get a, a you know, a decent dyno for like nine bucks a month. But for development, you don't need to pay. Um, you need to give your application a name. Um, ah, hate that. And you, that's probably me. Uh, let's say food test two. No. <laughs> Who's creative in here? Mark. Ah, damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, let's say foo SMS2. That should be free. Yeah. And we'll say we want to run it in Europe. And then we create the application. So now I've created an application. There's nothing running in it. It's empty so far. Um, but what we also can do now is to um, start adding stuff in here. And those things um, can be um, like a database. And we need a database, right? So we need to uh, uh, install Heroku Postgres. And you can choose your um, yeah, different you know, versions here. The free will work just fine for this. Um, you get, I think, 10,000 rows in your database for free. So we just provision one of those. And now we have a database. And it's all configured, so I, my application already will have that in an environment. So it can find this database, underscore URL, it's there. Um, another thing that I think we should add, uh, we talked about logging. There is an application called Paper Trail. Since this will be running in the cloud, the, you can use the Heroku tool belt to get hold of your logs easily. Um, but it's just it saves just a little amount of, of your logs. So if you need to go back and debug something later on, you use something like uh, Paper Trail to uh, actually look at your uh, uh, your saved log logs. Uh, and let's see if I go in here. This is the application we were demoing about against before. And if I go into this application here, you can see. Uh, hopefully, yeah, yeah. Um, this is all the information that was submitted here before, so I can go in and read these log files. 
I can search in the log files. I can search for the different, um, which different server that received this request. I can filter on time. I can do a lot of things. You know, this is a great tool in, if you need to, to check out your, your logs. Um, yes, what's next? We need to deploy to our um, to our environment, but we are running a little bit late here on time, so I will not um, deploy on this new instance. I will actually look at this that one that is already running. So the next thing I would need to do is actually configure a little bit more, and I can do environment variables in here. So the database, this one was created by default when I added Postgres. This one is the connection information to paper trail. It's all configured. I don't need to do anything more with these. This is to be able to connect to Twilio. I need this. If you remember in the beginning of my uh, code, I'm checking for this. And um, I need to tell the application what protocol to use. So I need to enter that in here. And I'm using HTTPS only. If, if I now... was going to deploy my, my code in here. I'm going back to my, my terminal and I'm actually gonna do this. Um, git remote, As I, I told you that um, we are deploying through Git. So I'm looking at the, uh, the remote repositories that is connecting to my repository here. And they are connecting to to this repository hosted on Heroku.com. And that is actually a repository connected to my application on Heroku. Um, if I would now just go in here and open server, I could write in here console.log hello Mark. I'm picking on Mark today. Oops. I always did when we were working together back in, in the days. So now I, now I did a change at least, so you can see when I'm doing this. So git status, I should see one file modified. So let's, um, let's add that one and let's commit and put a message adding mark. So everything I've done so far is local. So now I want to, to deploy this change to Heroku. And that's uh, really, really easy. Heroku, no, sorry. Git, git push Heroku master. And everyone that's been working with Git has done this command like 1,000 million times, but maybe using git push origin master or something else. But essentially I'm pushing my code now to to Heroku. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. What happens now is Heroku receives the code and depending on what I have in my Git repository, it figures out what build packs it needs to use. It figures out that it needs to use the Node.js build pack. It's looking into my package.json file. It realizes that I need all these dependencies, so it's using npm to pull down um, the database, express, all of those kind of things, and building that together. If this was a Go application, Go is a compiled language, it will actually compile the application in this stage as well. If I were using a custom build pack, you can use many build packs at the same time, so you can use the Node.js build pack and a custom build pack. Let's say that I would be needing some functionality that is merging PDF files. I have that in a specific build pack. That build pack will be brought in and built at this stage as well. And this all happens without bringing down my live application. When this is all built, we're being launched and the site is live. That means that if I do this, uh, so let's first of all go back and open paper trail. I open that in, in a new window here. Uh, 
can see the code here already says hello Mark. So this is running in the cloud now. Um, the code. It's it's that simple to to deploy and change code. Let's say um, we don't want to have have Mark in in the cloud. We can uh, can remove him easily. Um, so you can see under activity here. Uh, you can see that this is the deployment I did uh, here. But I can say, oh shit, something went wrong. Let's roll back. And now I'm at version nine. Now we don't have Mark in here anymore. We can look at at this. Is this the right one? Ah, there is booting. It's done. So 26, this is the, the first one. And then we roll back to version 9 and we don't see Mark anymore. So it's easy to deploy something and if you realize something is, is, is wrong, it's super easy to roll back the functionality. What about uh, scaling? Let's say our application is running slow because there is so many people sending SMS to us at the same time. Um, I actually scaled my application in the beginning of this presentation. Um, you can use the Heroku tool. You can see you can most of the commands I'm doing here in the, or all the commands I'm doing here in in the terminal. You can also do on, on in the web if you like that more. Um, and I could have rolled back from here as well. But, um, so for example, I can use Heroku PS that will show me uh, the processes I have available. And now I have one process running of the type web. And what I did when, uh, when, when we started this presentation, I used this command, PS scale uh, web. I used 10 before, but I'm just going to use four. Um, this is a production dyno. You can see it's a standard one. So that costs me $36 a month. And when I did th the demo before, I had 10, which means I'm paying $360 a month. But I'm just paying for the time I'm using it. So, um, And now I have four. So I have four times 30, whatever it is. And if I do Heroku PS, um, you see I have all four up and running. And on, on a production system, I, I'm recommending you to have at least a few dinos running because um, sometimes we forget to not follow that null pointer or that you shouldn't divide by zero or something that will cast or, or throw an un, uncaught un exceptions. Your application will crash. It's never happened to me, but I know people that has happened to. And what will happen then is that your application will go down. It will stop working. It will stop responding uh, for a little while, a few minutes. And then Heroku realizes that, oh, something is wrong. And it cycles your dyno and you're up again. Um, but if you have a few uh, dynos running, yes? Uh, yeah, have they added the port auto-tune? Uh, no. I've no, there is things outside of it that you can use to to scale. I I've not been that lucky, so I've faced that problem yet. So, um, yeah. So use a few because then you, you are a little bit resilient to to those kind of problems. No, so it will. When, when you mean when I deploy the application? When you're sending whatever app, uh, a new update. Yeah, so I do a deployment up, so it builds everything. What happens is these are untouched, and then it spins up a new dyno environment or a new container where it's going to build the application. When this application is built, uh, these are being shut down and the other ones takes down. So the downtime is very, very short. And something that you should be aware of about as well, a dyno will never lo live more than a, a, an hour, or sorry, a, a day, 24 hours. And that is to, uh, I read somewhere that it's about uh, being more resilient about software with memory problems. 
So if your application is leaking memory, it will be recycled every every day at least once anytime. And if you have many of these running, they will be recycled at the same time, of course. So you won't notice it. <laughs>